Thank you. It's great to have you all here today. So my conversation actually is a, it's a great uh, segue from your last speaker, um, really taking the next step to some things we can do together, the things you can do. And if I can just see a, a quick show of hands, I, I myself am a business owner and a building owner. Do we have building owners in the room as well? Um, so a, a couple. So this conversation really is gonna speak to then, how does a business owner who is a tenant help make some decisions as to what to do next as they're looking at their risks? Um, the, the conversations that we're having today about sustainability and resilience, we speak to our businesses, our families, our communities. From a structural engineering perspective, because I'm a structural engineer, I speak to it about buildings. But it's not about the building itself, it's about what the building provides you as business owners and, inten and tenants of those buildings. A structural engineer doesn't do anything if all we do is design a building. We have to provide that building so that you can actually run your business and so that you can have a staff to support your business and most importantly, after a disaster so that that business can continue to operate in a familiar environment. The most familiar environment that you're gonna have is the building you're in today. So, there are a lot of conversations out there. There is a building code out there, and there are ordinances that are helping to enhance that building code. So my topic today was really about the, the, the ordinances that come out of cities that cause building owners, business owners, to make some decisions as to how to spend their money and how to get the, the most effective cost control out of that money. So I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit of the ordinances and the cost control, the risk reduction, and what does it really mean from a couple of different perspectives. Um, and it's really about viewing those ordinances and viewing your operations. Seismic safety ordinances throughout Southern California, it's not just Southern California, they are actually statewide. The first statewide uh, ordinance was really focused on URM buildings. There's a statewide mandate that cities, biz, building owners must have a voluntary program to retrofit URM buildings. Uh, I'm sure in Pasadena you have walked through and you may not actually pay attention to it, but on URM buildings that have not yet been retrofitted, they must have a placard on the building that identifies this building as an unreinforced URM building so that the people that are going into that business, quite often it's a restaurant, um, so that the, those, those tenants and occupants know that there's a risk there. Um, Beverly Hills, Burbank, Long Beach, Los Angeles, Pasadena, Santa Monica, Torrance, West Hollywood are all jurisdictions in Southern California that have either implemented or are talking about implementing specific programs to retrofit buildings. Um, the program focuses can be voluntary or mandatory. The URM one is a voluntary program. Uh, Los Angeles has some mandatory programs now about the wood soft story buildings. Uh, typically these are tuck under or what we call tuck under parking for apartments where you have your apartment and then you have a bunch of parking stalls underneath that apartment. Um, Concrete tilt-up masonry buildings, uh, usually an industrial type of building, uh, have retrofits. Different jurisdictions are either mandatory or um, voluntary. I believe LA Counties is a county-wide mandatory program to retrofit those buildings, but it's only the unincorporated portions of LA County. Each city has its own jurisdiction. Non-ductile concrete is another a big one that's in play in Santa Monica, West Hollywood, and Los Angeles. If you're in a 1976 or earlier concrete building, there is an ordinance that says that people have to look at those and make sure that they don't need to be retrofitted. Most, unfortunately, will need some level of retrofit. And those ordinances are age-based. Again, as we develop codes and as earthquakes or events happen, we learn more. So we are able to benchmark certain codes. Uh, Non-ductile concrete, 1976. Steel moment frame, high-rise moment frame buildings, 1994 uh, code issues. As we learn from earthquakes, we are able to address those better. So the biggest question is, is are the risks real? What you see is a series of photos in front of you that are from 1994 Northridge earthquake. 
I was a young engineer at the time. I had just passed my civil engineering license. I was brand new licensed engineer. I was called out to one of the large healthcare providers in uh, the west side. And my job was to review that campus for earthquake damage. And unfortunately, I had to condemn a building, a patient tower, that they never were able to reoccupy. It was a patient tower that performed exactly as it was supposed to perform based on the code. It was a life-safe performance, but they never were able to reoccupy it. And I think that's a big distinction that people have to understand. The code is good enough, as I believe it was Lauren just said, the code is good enough to help ensure we are able to get out of the building. The code is not intended to ensure that we can economically get back into the building. So we have to understand those expectations and we have to understand why then are ordinances necessary and how are we implementing those ordinances. Uh, the, the pictures here, it, it, uh, upper, is that my left? Um, the brace frames. It's, it's not just a steel moment frame. It's not just the high rises. These are braces that, that buckled and failed. The picture right in the middle top is a concrete non-ductile building. You can see about at the top of the, what is that, the second floor, third floor level, the, the windows are shorter than the windows above that because the columns at that level crushed and they actually shortened the story. That building doesn't exist anymore. That was torn down. There's another building in um, the valley over by the 405 and the 101 intersection that they actually were able to take the damage such as this. They jacked the building up, restored the columns, and were able to re repair it. It was a cost-benefit analysis. Just one building owner could do it, one building owner couldn't do it. The tenants in this building in the middle never got back in, and very few of them actually got their business operations out of that building because it was condemned and it was deemed unsafe. Uh, picture here at the bottom uh, is a tilt-up building. It's, uh, I believe, a furniture store, actually, but it is indicative of just about every tilt-up building out there in Southern California. It's, that's not snow on the ground in front of it on the lower. That's actually the wall panels that have fallen away and landed on the ground. And that's why you see the roof has buckled down. It actually occurred on two sides. Um, there's an ordinance out to retrofit what we call wall anchors. We tie those walls back to the building. It makes it more effective. I think the pictures would indicate that the risks are, in fact, real. This was 1994. It was a, what we would consider a moderate to severe earthquake. This was not a severe earthquake, Northridge. So if we agree the risks are real, how do we address them? Jurisdictions, cities, governments, they struggle with this, I am sure. How do we create something that a business owner and a building owner has to address without making it so onerous that we all just put our blinders on and ignore it. Um, the main opportunity is really about raising awareness. For I'm sorry, um, I hate podiums. Thank you for that. So, so the, 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 real, the, the real thing that a jurisdiction can do is a jurisdiction is trying to wait, raise the awareness of the community as to what things are critical for that community. Resilient communities, the, the livelihood of the community after disaster is only as good as the awareness of that entire community. That's what jurisdictions are trying to do. They're trying to raise your awareness. The owner's answer, whether you are a business owner that leases the building or a building owner that offers the building up or uses the building yourself, perhaps your answers are different. Can you reduce the risks? And then are you focused on just reducing the risk? Or are you focused on reducing the risk as cheaply as possible? Um, two different outcomes from that. When we set a code, we tend to design that code as a design minimum. That's a minimum standard that we must do. That doesn't mean that that's all we can do, 
We can actually do more. It's just that we must do a minimum standard. I, I have the uh, next couple of pictures because I want to answer the question of, are we really trying in, in codes and in businesses, are we trying to reduce risks? Or are we trying to do whatever is the minimum we need to do to get by as cheaply as we can possibly do? I have a couple of pictures. These are the soft story apartment buildings that we are faced with. The risk is that because that soft story has no system to keep it from racking, that will, in an earthquake, topple over. I will go back to this picture here. What you're not seeing is you're not seeing the lower story of that apartment building. You're seeing a balcony. This is a, that's a second floor balcony that is on the ground because that soft story parking level has collapsed and that entire building has sat down on the ground. Um, so when I, as a structural engineer, I'm faced with doing an upgrade to this building, I can very cost, uh, I'm, I'm not even gonna say it's, it's, it's uh, how, how to say this, I can very cheaply satisfy a code ordinance. I can do the bare minimum and this would be the bare minimum. A single column that is now trying to hold up the entire building, that single column is removed from the building so that there's a lot of twisting that's going on and that's why this triangular uh, cap has been created is to try to bridge this. I can also, see if there's a pointer on this. Ooh, now I really did it, didn't I? Sorry about that. Somebody get me back to a slideshow. Thank you. I hate podiums, I hate microphones, and I'm not very tech savvy. I'm a structural engineer. Thank you. So this is a picture of a similar building where we have one column that is being used to resist, the, again, the entire story. And we have had to strip the stucco all the way along the base of that second floor in order to put all those shiny clips to get the load to come down to that single column. This is not very redundant. What we've also done is we've severed the upper story stucco, which is the lateral shear wall that's taking the load from that upper story, and it has to get down to that lower story. We've severed that capacity right above all of those shiny little connectors, which means we've really actually made it more deficient. Believe it or not, this is ordinance compliant. But did I reduce risk? Fortunately, this isn't my design, so I don't have to actually answer that question. Flip side to that is here's an example of a similar construction. What you're gonna see now in the black are three different two column frames, far more redundant, and they are more evenly spaced, so I'm not having to cut away nearly as much stucco. You can see small discrete spots of stucco that have been disconnected, because now I have a more redundant system. This is risk reduction. That is cheap compliance. There's a big difference. So when you, when you make your decisions, I suggest that in your conversations with your designers, with your financiers, making sure that you're understanding the opportunities that are out there. Some quick closing thoughts. Being prepared is more than having your go bag. You, you need to understand and you need to control your risks. As, as business owners, previous presentation talked about what can you do within your business to make sure that you have that reliance you need. Certainly within a building format, you can work with your owner to understand what that risk is. You can suggest to the owner that it is more critical to assure that a current tenant is able to remain than to lose a tenant and have to re-lease that building after an event. 
all of the apartment owners that will lose a tenant because their tuck under parking has racked or has been deemed unsafe, I would suggest that 99% of those apartment tenants will not come back to that apartment when that owner has repaired the building. They will have had to leave and find someplace else to live, and that will be their new starting point. As a, as a business owner, if I'm in a lease and my lease allows me the opportunity to make that move, I'm probably not going to come back to that building that I was in prior to the earthquake. I've got to understand that risk and I've got to balance out those costs and make sure that I've uh, properly addressed them. The next statement is really obvious. You are in control until you aren't. And unfortunately, in a disaster, you are not in control after that disaster happened. There are so many other interfaces that are going on. The best way to get control and regain control after an event is to have it before the event started. Do your retrofits if you can. Certainly have your go bag. Certainly understand your IT. One of the biggest risks to tenants who are business owners isn't going to be the building, because to a certain extent, I understand that as a tenant, you have less control over what you can work with your landlord, although hopefully that's a conversation that's possible. Most damage in an earthquake is going to cause, be caused by your equipment toppling over because it's not properly anchored, your infrastructure being disrupted. So address those issues. If you have heavy equipment, anchor it. If you have and rely on water systems, make sure they're anchored. If you are gas supplied, make sure your gas has an automatic seismic shutoff. Easy things to do, that incremental low-hanging fruit that was, that was suggested. Do your assessment to go through it. Um, and plan your recovery. Because if you've planned your recovery, if you've planned your building's performance, if you understand those issues, you are able to actually have that functional building after the event, and you are able to maintain that control in a familiar environment. This is a picture of the fault ruptures, not perfectly defined. Again, I'm a structural engineer, not a geologist. But this is Ridgecrest. You see a small cluster of blue circles down here on the lower portion of the photo. That is the city of Ridgecrest. The upper blue is the city of Trona. And then the red lines are the two fault ruptures, the smaller one for the uh, July 4th earthquake, the larger one for the July 5th earthquake. Did we dodge a bullet? I don't know if you paid much attention, there was not a lot of reported damage after this Ridgecrest earthquake. Certainly there was some, there was some disruption of businesses and so forth. Did you think, do you think we dodged a bullet? I see some no's and some yeses. I'm gonna suggest that we didn't dodge anything because dodging means we actually actively participated in moving out of the way. I think we got lucky. Same zoom, same map scale. Of course, there isn't a particular fault exactly where I drew the red lines, but for the scope and scale of magnitude, this is what would be affected in Southern California anywhere around the area. The risk is real, and our opportunity is to start changing how we perceive whether to just cheaply comply or actually take the initiative to do something more and reduce that risk. So a little bit about the structural engineers. I have the pleasure today of speaking on behalf of them as their president of the Structural Engineers Association of Southern California. As it was introduced, um, it is the largest or oldest professional, one of uh, professional engineering associations in the world. There are 100 plus members in Southern California ready and willing to serve. Um, for more information, please visit the website I have listed there, and there is a specific member referral that I've also listed there. Give you a second to jot it down, or I'm sure that you can speak to the sponsors and get that information, or take that famous photo of the screen. And unfortunately, I don't have, I'm not able to stay much past the 1.30, so depending on questions, if I can answer any quick questions now, that'd be fantastic. 
otherwise there's some contact information as well. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. Um, so after an event, that's a great question, and, and the quick but long answer is after an event, the city will send out inspectors. Those inspectors will be called up from state resources. Um, those inspectors will include city officials as well as volunteer structural engineers from throughout the region that have gone through a certification program. Their task is to tag a building, green, yellow, red. If it's a green building, it means that you can use it as if nothing happened. If there is a yellow tag on it, it means that your access is restricted until identified hazards have been addressed. If it is red tagged, it means that not only is it restricted, but it is not able to be accessed. As a structural engineer going into a red tag, I can't actually as a structural engineer, just walk into a red tag building. I have to get the building official's permission to go into that red tag building in order to help my now client recover. A red tag does not mean that the building is condemned and must be demolished. It just means that it has been identified as having severe enough damage that a formal structural assessment must be made. But if it has been red tagged, that means somebody has identified some pretty serious damage that is going to need to be retrofitted, repaired, and it's going to take time, resources to do that. There's no magical 30 days, 60 days, 100 days, two years behind that red tag, but it means that a, a formal assessment must be made. It does not mean that the building must be condemned and torn down. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon.